this time on Legal Logic, we'll be taking a closer look at the formation of the jury system. For many, most of what we know about the jury is what we've seen on television. The system we know today finds its origins in medieval Europe. The right to a trial by jury was a major factor in the American Revolution and is also one of the constitutional foundations of American law. So important was the concept of a trial overseen by a jury of one's peers that it was included within the Bill of Rights. Hello and welcome to Legal Logic. I'm Bonnie Richardson and I'll be hosting today's program. Today we'll be discussing the formation and history of the jury system as we've come to know it. I'm joined by two members of the legal and judicial community, Judge Janice Wilson, who served on the Multnomah County Circuit Court, and Professor Laura Appleman from Willamette University College of Law. Welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Seeing as we're looking at the jury from more of a historical perspective, I'd like to start by asking you just why is the right to a trial by a jury of one's peers so important? And I think we'll start with you, Judge Wilson. Well, for me, that's an easy one. Uh, it seems a cliche sometimes, but it really is the cornerstone of our democracy. When we talk about government of the people, by the people, and for the people, I think it is exemplified nowhere better than in trial by jury. Members of the community coming in, uh, acting as the conscience of the community, uh, expressing what is viewed as reasonable in the community and deciding the facts. And you've presided over criminal and civil trials? Yes. How many? <laughs> Would you guess? Um, it's in the hundreds. And what's your typical reaction from jury members who finished a jury trial? I try to talk to jurors after every trial if I can, and most of the time a few people at least stay to talk. One of the comments I have heard over and over and over again from jurors is how impressed they were with how well the system worked and how their own opinion of the jury trial system and our system of government improved as a result of their experience. And they often say, you know, I was surprised. I looked around the table, I looked at my fellow jurors, I saw we come from all walks of life, such disparity among us. How were we going to deal with these questions? Often extremely important and serious cases and issues. And they said, but everyone took it so seriously. And I have so much more confidence now than I ever did about my fellow citizens and about how our system works. Hmm. Professor Alpeman, I want to ask you about um, maybe the differences between criminal and civil juries. Sure. Um, so. Uh, criminal juries for the most part tend to be either uh, six or twelve member juries uh, and civil juries I mean I can defer to Judge Wilson here uh, the the rules are a little different um, but I mean I just I did want to reiterate how much I agree with Judge Wilson on her uh, stance that uh, jury service is really I would say the lodestone of our system of uh, democracy and really the criminal justice system. In fact, uh, our, we, I think we're the only uh, country in which we enshrine the right to a jury trial not once but twice. So we, of course it's in the Sixth Amendment in our Bill of Rights, but it's also uh, in Article Three. And so the founders thought this was so important. Article Three of the Constitution? The Constitution yes, sorry. That, uh -huh. uh, that th they said it twice. And there's, there's no other uh, personal or collective right that is uh, doubly mentioned in our Constitution. So uh, it, it not only is it a critical right now, but it always has been. Before we delve further into the formation of the jury, we've got a short clip we'd like to share, which I hope offers a better understanding of the medieval and British origins of the jury. So let's roll the clip. The jury system that we know today, for the most part, can be traced back hundreds of years to medieval England. At the root of the system is that when people are charged with a crime or have a civil dispute, their issue should be resolved by a jury of their peers. Twelve people from the community that they live in. Twelve people who come to a decision based on the facts and in accordance with the law. Prior to juries, the English justice system had some pretty interesting ways of deciding the facts, and these were called trial by ordeal. So instead of a judge and jury, a priest was normally in charge. Innocence or guilt was not decided by the facts. There were no attorneys, no defense, no evidence. Innocence was believed to be proved by God's intervention. And of course, 
the punishments were well out of proportion to the crime. What exactly were these trials by ordeal? Well, there's the infamous trial by water. If you sink, you're innocent. If you float, you're guilty. And of course, if you float, it'll be off with the head. A disputed fact could be resolved through trial by battle, or more or less a fight to the death, a little bit different from the adversarial system we know today. On conquering England in 1066, William the Conqueror brought with him a system of having witnesses who knew about the matter tell a court of law what they knew. In fact, the word juror comes from the Norman French jurer, which means to swear. It was a few years later that the trials by ordeal came to an end. King Henry II started to make some real changes to the justice system. These acts were called assizes. The assizes were a new way to resolve disputes over property and inheritance. Twelve free and lawful men were assembled under oath to provide information as to who was the rightful property owner or heir. These witnesses were often people with first-hand knowledge of the incident. The 15th and 16th centuries saw the jury further evolve. Juries began to hear evidence and judges were much more central to the trial. However, if a judge or the state didn't like the verdict, the jurors could be imprisoned or lose all of their personal possessions. According to the history books, in 1670, when a jury refused to convict Quaker William Penn of preaching in the streets, the judge fined the jurors and threatened to cut off the nose of the jury foreman, Edward Bushel. Bushel appealed and England's Chief Justice ordered him freed. And the right of the jury to act independently was affirmed. As the jury continued to evolve, this independence was at the heart of the rebellion in the American colonies. Hello and welcome back to Legal Logic. Well, that was a sprint through history, and it certainly appears that it was a long road to a jury trial. Now that we have an understanding of the history, I'm interested in finding out a little more about jurors as witnesses. Professor Appleman? Well, one of the things to remember, uh, even when we're talking about you know, the more recent past, say 15th, 16th, and 17th century England, um, trials then looked very different. In fact, there were really only two or three parties. There was the judge, there was the jury, and occasionally, if it was a state case, uh, you know, the crown, there was someone for the crown. There were no prosecutors for small crimes. Uh, up until, I think, the mid-17th century, defense counsel uh, were, was barred. You could not have defense counsel. So the jurors had to be the witnesses because they had to be uh, what we called of the vicinage, right? So of the county. Uh, so these were, originally, jurors were supposed to be people who knew the defendant, presumably knew the victim, if we're talking about a criminal case or uh, the plaintiff. Uh, hmm. and, uh, and so the jurors had to be witnesses because that's, that's all they did. And at that point, and uh, jurors were both the triers of law and the facts. So of course today, juries find facts to decide the case, but they're certainly not making the law. That's the role of legislatures and Congress, uh, and occasionally, uh, you know, public initiative. But, but back the jury then, doesn't decide the law. Correct. And uh, uh, the judges decide the law. The judges, right? That's yeah. the that's the judges' case. But mm -hmm. back back then, and really even coming over uh, to America, both in in the colonies and afterwards, uh, the juries really played an absolutely central role. It's interesting, the jurors as witnesses, so you had to know some of the facts in the case and the parties. Well, in fact, that's why they were chosen. That's why they wanted to be a jury of your peers was in that sense. Now, now of course, we want jurors who aren't involved in the case, but back then you wanted a jury of your peers, uh, peers, of course, being white land-owning men, mm -hmm. but a jury of your peers, so because they actually presumably knew what was going on. Remember then that communities were very small, so of jury of your peers was obviously someone who's lived in the same hamlet or village. Hmm. And, and, and comparing that today, Judge Wilson, uh, I think it was touched on a little bit by Professor Appleman, but um, are you supposed to know about the case beforehand when you um, sit as a juror? Well, it, it is interesting. It's almost a 180 degree turn from those historic origins uh, where you the purpose of your being on the jury uh, originally was because you did know something about the case and the facts and the parties. And now, in uh, at least in larger communities where there's a large enough population to avoid it, uh, knowing something about the case and the facts and the parties is 
basically a reason for you not to be on the jury. Mm -hmm. um, and and I've, I've had people ask about that and ask questions about that, and I'm a little curious about your opinion about this, Professor Appleman, because in my view, it's not exactly a 180 degree turn right. uh, in that we still want everyone who is involved in the decision making to be on the same footing. So as actually one of the issues we deal with contemporaneously, I don't want to get too far afield from historical roots, but now we're worried about people, jurors who may not have known anything before they were chosen for the jury, doing independent research while they're on the jury. And I think the reason that we are so concerned about that is we want everyone knowing what the basis for the decision is, which is actually the situation we used to have right. when uh, all of the jurors did know something about it as well. So it's not exactly a complete contradiction. In some ways, it brings us back, maybe not full circle, but in a spiraling kind of way. I think what Judge Wilson uh, really uh, is picking up here is that it's important to have, when everyone's on the same footing, the reason we want someone now from the community, now as then, is that we assume that there's something, there's something special about uh, the community's participation in, you know, let's say, the criminal justice system. Uh, and of course, when we start thinking about, well, how does the right to the jury trial have a part in the American Revolution? Well, uh, the clip showed William Penn. So William Penn, of course, came over here. Pennsylvania. He was the royal mm -hmm. governor, and he was one of the very first uh, governors to write uh, a colonial charter, setting out rights for his uh, colonial subjects, and he was the first one to enshrine the right to a jury trial, understandably. Uh, in fact, most of the colonies uh, before uh, the revolution was even imagined uh, had, uh, had their own colonial charters, which specifically mentioned the right to the jury. Uh, and this was a very uh, closely and dearly held right. Hmm. I think we'll talk about that in a bit, about the Declaration of Independence and how that came about. It's very interesting. So this may seem like a major preamble, but it does help set the stage. We can all agree that something akin to a jury trial was well underway, and without a jury of our peers, punishments could get pretty severe. So let's cut to the chase. The American colonies also managed to have juries that showed resistance to what it perceived as unjust British laws. More significant, the British Crown made many attempts to deny American colonists their right to trial by jury. How did the jury serve as a rallying point for the revolution? Well, well before the revolution, uh, there is a famous case called the Zenger Trial. Uh, this is in 1737 in New York. And that, uh, although it was technically a civil trial, uh, involved a publisher, uh, like Peter Zenger, who published uh, what the Crown believed was libel about the New York governor. Uh, and he said, well, the defense to libel is truth. Uh, and the judge uh, rejected that and said, uh, in fact, I'm going to decide for you, and I'm deciding that this is libel, and hence we're going to throw you in jail. And uh, New York City, uh, always an opinionated place, uh, practically went into riots, uh, and because, uh, once again, they felt that the British Crown was usurping their right to decide the facts and the law, and so they triumphed, and Zenger was not uh, held accountable for uh, you know, what he was publishing on the royal governor. And I think that, uh, as well as, of course, the much more well-known case of the uh, British soldiers uh, firing into the crowd that uh, John Adams defended. Now, uh, so, that, so that maybe what you're saying is that the Zenger case and then this other subsequent thing that happened, um, the whole idea and um, want for a jury trial kind of helped to precipitate the revolution. Absolutely. The hmm. great concern was, as, as the colonies be got, became more rebellious, at least in the Crown's view, is that the, uh, they said, not only are you not going to have a jury of your peers, we are going to take you, and your case is going to be tried in England. So it's about as far away from a jury of your peers as possible. And combined with some of the other uh, minor irritants that the Crown was doing, like l allowing the uh, Crown agents to ransack your place and, uh, you know, forcing the tea tax, you know, small minor yeah. things. Uh, <laughs> this this really uh, inflamed uh, those, uh, you know, I guess our founding fathers and really the, the bulk of the, co the colonists who really felt that uh, trial, trial by a jury, by a local jury uh, was, uh, and, you know, really, I think 
ultimately with a local judge, right, and someone not controlled by the crown, uh, was really a, a foundation for uh, ordered liberty. And then um, the founding fathers included that in the Constitution. They did. Uh, you know, as I said, uh, not only in the actual Constitution in Article Three, but uh, in the Bill of Rights, uh, there was before all the uh, states would ratify the Constitution, there was they insisted to have this sort of addendum, this extra Bill of Rights, making sure that this was uh, so you know so crystallized. Uh, they didn't, you know, I mean, they always say uh, Britain has an unwritten Constitution. Well, in America, we ha we like it written down. We like our John Hancock's on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think uh, one of the reasons this was again a, a fundamental right to, uh, you know, our beginning of our nation. Could I, I want to touch on yeah. one of the other aspects of this, too, because well before we got to the Constitution, which took a while, uh, after the Revolutionary War, as was mentioned earlier, the threat to the right to a jury trial, the fact that, that King George had, in many cases, deprived the colonists of the right to a jury trial, was specifically listed as a justification uh, for the War of Independence in the Declaration That's of Independence. Right. I mean, I think in our history classes we tend to focus on taxation without representation and so on without looking at many of those other grievances. And in this case, I think it's important, as has already been mentioned, that it was paired with the problem of the Crown's control over the judges, uh, their terms of office and their pay. King doesn't like the uh, judge's ruling. Well, uh, you know, you're out of here. But you can imagine the potential that had for corruption. And uh, so you want to, the exact opposite of that is folks in the local community who have that authority, who don't have their pay controlled by the king, uh, whose jobs aren't controlled by the king. They come in, they, they make their decisions, and they go. So those two things, I think, paired together uh, about the importance of the independence of the judicial branch, of the judiciary, and the jury right to a jury trial as the backbone of that need to be viewed together. Mm. Absolutely. Um, and you know, just to fast forward, I guess, to Oregon. Oregon has a constitutional right to a jury. It does. And was that part and of the civil and criminal cases? And mm -hmm. it, it, it's interesting, too, that the Oregon Constitution specifically prohibits uh, another court from reviewing a jury's determination of the facts. Yeah. Uh, and really making clear how enormous that power is. Unlike the historical examples that we've seen earlier, well, uh, we don't like your decision about the facts. Jurors go back and make a different decision, or if you don't, I'm going to you know, cut off the presiding juror's nose. Uh, <laughs> and I, I think what you see in the Oregon Constitution, uh, which of course uh, Professor Appleman knows this history better than I, modeled in part on the Indiana Constitution, but that specific protection of the jury's finding about the facts is also in response to those uh, historical threats and insults to the right to the jury. That's right. Um, one of the one of the things I think we because it's listed in the Bill of Rights, we tend to think of a right to a jury trial as solely the defendant's right. And of course, it is a defendant's right. Defendant you in can, a criminal case. That's right. Defendant okay. in a criminal case, uh, or you know, if you're if you're a plaintiff in a civil case. However, at least in the criminal justice system, uh, I think it was or originally envisioned as as much of the community's right as anything else. And you know, again, getting back to Judge Wilson's point that uh, you know the the community. It's really, I think, one of our, our last remaining ways of uh, participating uh, in democracy, uh, you know, and really, I think, uh, public citizenship, right? So the, I would say the, the participation uh, in the jury is really something that not only uh, is available to almost everyone, but uh, really, I think, is a pillar of what we really believe democracy can be. And so in order to be on a jury, you have to be a citizen? That's right. And yeah. what are the other requirements? Uh, you cannot have been, in most states you can't have been convicted of a felony. Um, you need to uh, obviously be uh, mentally firm uh, okay. and uh, you know usually, and you have to be, you can't be a minor. Um, and so, again, different, uh, in fact, I'm going to defer to Judge Wilson uh, more specifically uh, on the, you know, these are sort of the broadest national uh, mm -hmm. things. Um, but it's but people in the community. People in the community. Mm -hmm. And, of course, unlike uh, yesteryear, you can be a woman. 
<laughs> you can be a person of color. You 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 need not uh, own property. Uh, often you you in fact of course how, how do they uh, how are you selected for jury trial? Well, the DMV, right? So once you once 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 you register for uh, or for voting, that's actually usually how we get much of our jury rolls. But uh, I in want fact, to go to that too about you know what you just commented on because you know the the picture that we saw in one of those segments showed. Uh, uh, I think I saw two women maybe on there, but uh, men dressed in suits. Uh, yes. Is that uh, how the juries look today? Uh, not at all. Uh, <laughs> I'm very pleased to say uh, they do represent, uh, I think, very well a cross section of our community. There are always problems we have. There's not going to be a statistic, precise statistical correlation in every pool of jurors that's summoned or in any group that's uh, called into the courtroom. It's a random process, and it's random in part to try and maintain that cross-section. Mm -hmm. If uh, people, we only had all volunteer juries, we would have trouble getting that cross-section. But we definitely have uh, women, we have people of color, uh, new immigrants. That is one of the most satisfying things for me as a judge, to talk to the new immigrant who's just served on a jury and uh, really feels that full participation as a citizen. Often they say they feel that more strongly serving as a juror than they did when they first voted. Wow. Uh, I want to kind of go back to that too about how did this all evolve? It looked like perhaps before the 14th Amendment it was mostly all men on a jury. And how did uh, the amendment change the jury makeup? Uh, well, there was the passage of the amendment and then there was the actual implementation of the amendment mm -hmm. and uh, you know I think as everyone knows uh, although uh, you know, Technically, uh, the 14th Amendment uh, had been passed. It was, uh, it was a federal law, and so it was not really incorporated against the states until the mid-1960s. Uh, and it really, even after the Civil Rights Movement, it took a lot of time, uh, you know, not just in the South, uh, everywhere, uh, for uh, juries to become more racially mixed. Uh, and even up until the 70s, in regards to women, women could is if women said, I have children, they were almost automatically excused uh, by the judge. And so a lot of it has been social change. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think, uh, you know, that's really critical. Uh, but uh, I mean, and even, you know, even today, there's been a lot of interest by the Supreme Court uh, in this jury trial right. Uh, I mean, it's, you know, it's, it's not just history for history's sake, uh, you know, the, what's what, the Sixth Amendment in which the jury trial uh, is enshrined is really uh, an area of active interest uh, for the court because the court is very keen on saying that only the jury may decide uh, facts that increase punishment. So not even a judge anymore, only the jury, only this cross section of the community. So mm -hmm. in a way you could say the Supreme Court relies on this uh, you know, revolutionary constitutional history to uh, continue strengthening the jury right today. It seems like the jury's changed quite a bit since the medieval times up through the uh, change um, with the revolution. And I'm curious how you've seen the jury change. Well, uh, I, I'm not old enough to have seen a huge uh, change <laughs> in the jury system in my tenure on the bench, but it, a fascinating experience that I have had that has given me, really freshened my perspective, uh, uh, tying it to these historical roots, is meeting with judges from other countries, countries that do not have a jury system, countries that have started recognizing really why this odd little system we have is so important to the vitality of our democracy. And so they're starting to implement jury trials in some other countries. The judges come here and study how we do it. And meeting with those judges, I get, I so much better understand what the founders of our country were thinking and how uh, the availability of a jury trial stands as such a bulwark for our liberties and our protection. And when I used to do jury orientation in Multnomah County, I would sometimes say, because jurors in this country stand up to the most powerful institutions in the world, including sometimes their own government. Wow, that's quite a statement about our jury system. Professor Appleman. Just to sort of uh, pick up on what Judge Wilson was talking about. So uh, Alexis de Tocqueville, when he came and visited America in the early 19th century, was really taken with our jury trial system and noted that serving on a jury is the way that Americans learn citizenship. And I think that is just as true today as it was 200 years ago. Well, that's about all we have time for. 
I hope you've enjoyed our conversation this time on Legal Logic. I'd like to thank our guests for their insightful observations and their participation. The idea of justice has come a long way since medieval times. No trial by ordeal, no divine rights of kings, no dictator's orders or personal whim. At the very foundation of the democratic society is the guarantee to us all of the right to a fair trial by a jury of our peers. And as the founding fathers would like to remind us all, a democracy only works if we the people participate. I'm Bonnie Richardson. Until next time.